The Lord, I want to share with you this morning for the Word of God. We'll be going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a message that the Lord has laid on my heart, and I think it, it goes very well with the things that are happening here at this church with the uh, evangelistic program that, uh, that's being held on Wednesday evening. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, will change us, renew our minds, that we might be transformed in the image of Christ to a world that's lost and seeking for hope, we pray in Jesus' name. We are ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven. I'm reminded of, a, of an old Scottish preacher one time, and he, and he told his son, he said, if God has called you to preach the gospel, don't stoop to be a king. It's a great privilege that we have to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God. Think about it. You know, when we were children, and probably you were, many of you were brought up the way I was, when as children we were told there's two things that you don't, there's two subjects that you don't bring up in conversation. One of them is politics, and one of them is religion. How many ever, you know, that the, the, that's what my parents used to tell me. Uh, they, they figured it was just too dangerous and, uh, you know, too emotionally charged for peaceful discourse. You know, and the, the fact of the matter is a lot of times religious and political discussions, uh, they just deteriorate. And uh, to the point that, uh, you know, folks get mad, they get angry. Sometimes they even, I guess, get violent. But, uh, you know, I've, I've occasionally been known to get into uh, uh, political discourse. I've, I've, just, I've done that. I think we all have, haven't we? But I, don't worry about it this morning. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about any political figures, past or present, or any of that, because I have this morning, I am bound to share something with you that is the most important message that I could possibly share. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> Contrary to popular opinion, there aren't many ways to heaven. There are folks that say there are thousands, there are millions of ways of heaven. Uh, there are not so many ways to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. As, I'm, as Jenny knows, I'm, following, I'm very fond of saying, there are not many ways to heaven. There aren't even two. There's just one. There's one road to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Religious leaders and philosophers over the years, uh, they have tried and they claim to show people uh, the, the way. Buddha, for example, claimed to show people the way. 
I want you to know this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't just show the way. He is the way. As a matter of fact, in the book of John, it says that John declares he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world, the door of the sheepfold, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine, and so much more throughout the Bible in many locations, including the very last chapter in Revelation chapter 22. It says, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus Christ is everything from the from the beginning to the end and everything all along the way. And that's why I put my trust and my hope in him. In John chapter 10 and verse 1, Jesus said those that, who attempt to climb up some other way, they are thieves and robbers. You know, I have people sometimes debate with me and they say, you know, uh, Christ was all these... Uh, exclusive statements that Christ made that later on his disciples just made that up that was that was just something that they attributed that he didn't really he didn't really say those kind of things that he didn't really claim to be God that he didn't really say he was the only one I tell you what he must have said something because they got so angry even the religious leaders of his day that they crucified him on a cross. So by all means, these, these statements that Jesus made, they are true. He says, uh, Paul said in Timothy chapter 2, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That's, Jesus gave himself a ransom for all of us. And I just... She's doing a pretty good job with... She's pretty, doing a pretty good job with these slides up here when, when I didn't give her the list there. So... <laughs> I just... I just wondered about that. That's... That I, this is... My wife passed away in 2008. It just... the. Uh, just the, the two of us. But I, I could not ask for someone uh, to be more helpful. And, and I can tell you that what you, what you see in church, that's what it is all the time. You know, that's... Uh, uh, Jenny had a little... Uh, Jenny works for the virtual school. And, and she had a little child uh, the other day that I guess had came, come by there to take a test or something. And she said, the child asked, do you have any idea who my teacher is going to be next year? You know, and, uh, and Jenny, Jenny said, well, it's, it's going to be me. And she said, the child just went just crazy with joy, you know. But it's, uh, it's because of her nurturing and, and Christ attitude that she has. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34 tells us that Christ died and rose again and it's Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us. Christ alone is our mediator as I shared just a moment ago. The Apostle Paul uh, wrote in 1 Timothy, there, there's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We will... Uh, uh, Four weeks from right now, I'll be preaching at the International Church in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, uh, the, uh, in Poland, they're, about, they're better than 90% Catholic in Poland. And then in, uh, in uh, Romania, which will be, going, will be going in Romania several weeks out, uh, Romania is better than 80% uh, Eastern Orthodox and in both of those places uh, we kind of go round and round because you know they put a lot of stock in the priest as a matter of fact uh, a lot of folks it's not 
It's not what the Bible says, it's what somebody says the Bible means. You hear what I'm saying? And, you know, I, I tell folks, when someone tells you something like that, that means it's time to run, you know, because it's, it's, it's crazy, you see. But Jesus Christ is our mediator. Jenny and I, we've, as Jenny said, we don't really travel for the sightseeing. We've seen enough sights. We've, you know, that's... Uh, that's, that's not an issue. But we've seen some things that uh, there are cathedrals where they have on the side wall, they have mummified bodies of, uh, of previous leaders and things like that on display. And they have, and they have little, little altars there where people kneel and, and pray there at those mummies that are that are in there. Uh, places where they have uh, pedestals and on the pedestal a glass case with some bone fragments that are, that are supposedly from one of the apostles and things like that. All, all that kind of stuff that... And, uh, and I've debated with some of the religious leaders over there. I, uh, I debated with the... Uh, 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 Eastern Orthodox priest over these over the icons they had in their church. He said, those are just pictures. So we don't pray to those things. Those are just pictures and to remind people of different Bible stories and things like that. In about three minutes' time, he was telling me about some icon in some church somewhere over there that people go and stand in front of that thing and they're healed. You see? Uh, I, I'm sorry, but, you know, in, in my Bible, it's, that's called idolatry. Nowhere in Scripture are we instructed to worship or pray to Mary, saints, ancestors, angels, dead religious leaders, icons, relics, statues, or symbols. We're not to worship any of that stuff. The Bible condemns idolatry in any form. I'm going to even go further than that. Don't worship a graven statue or image of Christ. Don't worship the symbol of the cross. Don't worship any of those man-made objects. Worship Christ himself. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He bled and died that you might be redeemed. And he's there making intercession for you and I. Call upon his blessed name and pray to him, not on some object that you've built. And may I say that uh, idols can not only be something that, that are built materially, but they can be built more in the psychological realm. There are people that, uh, you know, they're... I'm not, I, I, I'm not going political. I'm not. But uh, there are people whose, whose, whose idea of Jesus looks a whole lot like Uncle Sam, if you know what I mean. And that's, and that's missing the mark very far. You see, as I say, we need to call upon the blessed name of Jesus Christ because there's one, there's one mediator. That on, when you watch TV, you've got, you see folks there that are praying to their grandpa or their uh, Uncle Louie that passed away or something like that. You know, that's, that's, not the, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. You see, we're, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. But it also, that also means telling the truth. Amen? Amen. One evening, uh, Jenny and I, we were eating in a little outdoor cafe in uh, Budapest, uh, Hungary. And... Uh, as we begin to share the message of the gospel with the waitress there and, uh, and give her one of these, what do you think of Christ? Whose son is he tracks? Uh, her response was, she said that uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their culture, she said matters of religion must be held in strict privacy. I was thinking, I didn't say, I was, I was kind. I, I, 
I didn't say something rude. Uh, I was thinking in my mind, you know, boy, the devil really loves that one, you know. But she said, uh, and matters of religion have to be kept in strict privacy. Uh, the fact of the matter is, folks, as Christians, listen to this. We have not been called to be secret agents. You see, uh, uh, I grew up as a little boy watching TV in the 60s and 70s in the Cold War, and they had that program, Secret Agent Man. You know, the secret agent man, they've uh, given you a number and taken away your name. You know, tell you what, Jesus Christ hasn't, hasn't given me a number. He knows me by name. Amen. Praise God. And we're representing the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there's nothing to be silent about there. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20 from our a scripture reference today. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though, listen, as though God were making his appeal through us that we have an opportunity to represent him. Jenny said, mentioned something, folks, on, well, how do you go to these places and everything? It's, we're not the greatest of anything. We're, we're just not. But uh, what we are is, is when we hear a still small voice, we, we say, we respond by saying, here am I, Lord, send me. Praise God. Here am I, send me. As though God were making his appeal right through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. It's very plain that God makes his appeal through us to be reconciled because man is a sinner and separated from the love of God. As they say in Spanish, el hombre es pecador. Man is a sinner and separated from the love of God. Our sin has separated us from his holiness, but in his mercy he's calling us to repentance. Many people are just frankly offended to hear that they don't fit God's standard, especially when a lot of them don't even believe that he exists. But as ambassadors for Christ, we function at his will. When you go out to represent a country, then you had better represent that country faithfully or you're going to have some questions to answer. And as we're ambassadors for Christ, then we have to uh, share his message faithfully and function at his will. We don't have the authority to misrepresent the gospel or water it down or anything like that. Because the fact remains, without repentance, there can be no reconciliation. Without repentance, there can be no reconciliation. Verse 20 says that God's making his appeal through us. What kind of an appeal is it? Well, Nicodemus was not invited to join a club. Hello. Jesus said you must be born again. Christ is coming back to rule and reign. Brother, he's not coming back to negotiate. Amen. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I believe the message of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I appreciate the concern that was expressed for a loved one. Without Christ, people are simply going to perish. That is the truth. Our friends... Our neighbors, our colleagues at work, relatives, all of them, without Christ, they're going to perish. And I have no desire to fight or get in any big arguments or anything, but I am compelled to share the words of eternal life. In John 6, uh, verse 68, we love people. We want them to be reconciled to fellowship with God and his provision for eternal life. Unfortunately, most people 
are traveling down a wide road of destruction that Jesus said brought us away of destruction. And many are going there. And as a matter of fact, they're not just walking in the days that we're living in. They're not just walking down the road of destruction. They're running down the road of destruction. An outspoken atheist and world famous entertainer recently said that he has no respect for people who claim to be Christians but do not attempt to share the gospel. Did you hear that? He said he has no respect for them. He reasoned that you must really hate people if you genuinely believe in heaven and hell but withhold the only message of hope. That's what an atheist said. He said, if, you're, if you really believe this, why are you not doing something about it? Many believers are afraid of rejection and awkward resistance. Most people want to be accepted, right? Since we were little kids. So unfortunately, many people are ashamed of Christ. Each day we need to take into account the words of Jesus and he said in Luke chapter 9, verse 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in their body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Our works and our deeds, brothers and sisters, are going to be tried by fire. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. You know, we're even admonished in the Old Testament. We're even admonished in the Old Testament to evangelism. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 18 and 19 says, When I say to the wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them, and speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die in their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person, <clears throat> and they do turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. Many people these days are self-righteous, they claim to be good people. Most folks, if you ask them, just ask them, are you a good person? Most folks are going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. They have the idea that, that uh, somehow or another on judgment day that God's going to set up a scale. Going to put the good things on one side and the bad things on the other and, and see which way it tilts. I don't know where they get that stuff from because I, you know, I... I've read this book from cover to cover a number of times and I, I, I never noticed anything like that, you see. But I do know that God's standards are a lot higher than ours. Did you ever lie, steal, use God's name in vain, lust after someone, covet your neighbor's possession? God calls all of these things sin. And this is what the Word of God has to say in James chapter 2, verse 10. You might want to buck, buckle your seatbelt for this one. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point. Oh, that's a lot better than I did. Anyone know what I'm talking about? And yet offend in one point, the Bible says, he is guilty of all. Might as well have just done all of it. Isaiah 64, verses 6 and 7 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and our righteousness is as filthy rags, as soil garments. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there's none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, 
and has consumed of us because of our iniquities. The world is in a mess. Mankind is in a mess. But what a wonderful opportunity that you and I have <clears throat> to share his love in such a time as this. He died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15. If you're a Christian living for Christ, the Great Commission tells you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian. And let me be clear, it's something that Jenny likes to share a lot. It's the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. It's not something that could be possibly done if you, if you get around to it. It's not an option. You know, I hear a lot of Christians sometimes say, uh, I wish I was in the full-time ministry. If you are a Christian, congratulations. You're in the full-time ministry. You are. There, as a matter of fact, you know how you see some businesses and they got full-time and part-time positions available? Uh, well, in the kingdom of God, there are no part-time positions available. They just don't have them. You are first and foremost in God's service. If you're laying bricks, if you're baking bread, you're teaching school, you're working in an office on Monday morning, any of those things, you're in the full-time ministry. But what are you doing with the opportunities that Christ has given you? Are you boldly proclaiming the gospel? Are you asking for God's Holy Spirit to anoint you and, and to speak to you? Uh, it's, it, you know, uh, I told Jenny when I, when I booked our, our flights inside of Europe. There's two different, we've got a, one company's flying us into Europe. And then in Europe, uh, all of our flights within Europe will be on the Polish airlines. And unfortunately, there are a lot of flights that have been canceled. There wasn't much available. So I told Jenny, I said, it wasn't possible to get seats beside one another. I just had to get what I could get. She didn't, you know, <laughs> get upset or anything like that. Uh, she just smiled. She says, well, she said, sounds like God's got some appointments for us. You know, because when we go on these trips, I can tell you right, I can tell you right now where the, the, where the first track is going. It's going to whoever that is sitting at the booth at USA Park at the parking place over in Jacksonville. That's, that's where we begin, right then and there. We got, on the, we got in the taxi last summer in Bucharest, Romania, about 5 o'clock in the morning, drove out of the parking lot. Taxi drivers, right off the bat, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do. The world has gone crazy. There's no one. Do you hear me? There is no one that I can trust. It's about a 30-minute ride from the airport to the, to the city center. So... Uh, you know, I'll let you guess what we did for the next 30 minutes. It wasn't talk about politics, I'll tell you that. It was talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There was a school of evangelism being held by one of our friends. And after several days, he went down and talked to the hotel staff where they were holding this conference. And he asked them if, if they had received any word of witness, any tracks. And, and he talked to he talked to maids and he talked to the doorman and he talked to the people at the desk and everything. Would you believe not one single person had received any word of testimony, any gospel track, anything at all at this hotel where the school of evangelism was being held? You know, what was the purpose of the evangel of this? Uh, you know, it's just, just to get together and have a good time, to get together with other believers, uh, maybe eat some good food, you know, enjoy some nice music or something like that. Uh, I'll be honest with you, and, and, don't, and don't get this wrong. I, I, you know, the Bible says, 
You know, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord and taste and see the Lord is good. I think that, I think that for the most part, when we go to church, it needs to be an uplifting experience. But I, I got to say, I get a little, I get a little nervous sometimes when I hear folks, you know, we shake my hand and we enjoyed the service, you know, because uh, I want to hear more. I want to, I want to hear folks, uh, saying that they've been brought into a deeper relationship with Christ or somehow or another they've been challenged to conform to the image of Christ. We used to sing an old song written way back in the 1800s that said, work for the night is coming. You remember that song? Work for the night is coming. Jesus said in John chapter 9 and verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet day. The night cometh when no man can work. We need to make the most of every opportunity because darkness is rapidly falling over this planet. Proclaim the gospel. Pass out tracts. Reach the lost. You know, anything that you can do. These precious opportunities. And I... I I, oh, I have a hard time every time I say what I'm about to say because I believe it so much. These precious opportunities will not continue. There'll come a day when you and I will never again have the opportunity to share Christ with the lost and dying world. You hear what I'm saying? That is, a, that is a limited quantity. That's not a, that's not, it's not an imposition or something. It's a blessed opportunity. The world's getting darker every day. Sin is celebrated globally. We were on the, we were in St. John's, Newfoundland several years ago. Up and down the main street like every business had a rainbow flag hanging out in front of it. Sin is celebrated globally and people take pride in their sin. Unborn babies are subjected to unspeakable violent destruction. They're, they're dismembered in some cases. All of it for profit and power. And I'm sad to say that instead of Instead of being a light in the world, many churches have become a mirror of the world. Did you hear that? Instead of being a light in the world, many churches have become a mirror of the world. But in the midst of all the chaos and wickedness, the glory of the Lord is our strength. And right now we have the privilege to carry the light into a dark world. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 60, verse 2, darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears where? Over you. Amen. That's the promise that God has for us. This morning, if you're not a Christian, I have good news for you. We have, the, we have a special message from heaven. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We need to proclaim together, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says... For in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. That's what he says. I tell you, if you don't know Christ, today is the day of salvation. He says that he will help you. You need to recognize that your sin has separated you from God. And repent and call on the name of the Lord. You know, some folks say, well, I can't, uh, 
you, you have like two groups. It's amazing. Like one group says, well, you know, I'm pretty good and, you know, God's going to have this scale on Judgment Day and I think I, I think I do more good things and bad things, so I think I'm, I think I'm like pretty good. And then, and then you go up to the other group. There's another group over here and they say, uh, you just don't know the things that I've done in my life. And not to mention the fact that Jesus said, if you think about doing it, you're just as guilty as if you'd done it. So, you know, that, uh, you know, we got one group, it's like, I'm too good to be saved. And another group, I'm too bad to be saved. Well, I got a message for both groups. The Bible says that, that Jesus came, that, that his salvation, that he died for the sins of the world. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You got to you, you got to repent, turn from your sins. God, I'm turn from my sin. I ask you the the Holy Spirit to help me to walk in obedience. Uh, uh, you cannot you can't earn your salvation. The Bible says the grace of God it's a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. See. You can't earn your salvation uh, by works. But when you've been saved, then there's, going to, then there's going to be some evidence that's going to transpire. And that's going to happen as you, as you allow the Holy Spirit to give you help. Well, I'm maybe gone over here a few minutes, but those things happen. I, I want us to... Uh, I want us to stand this morning as we begin to close. And this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if you need to commit your life to Christ, I want to invite you to come down here. We want to pray with you. Or if you have a, a loved one and you want us to agree together with you in prayer for their salvation, if we'd like to invite you to come along. Praise the Lord.